Hello, and welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. Each episode, we talk about a particular topic in the life of a professor. We are tenure-track faculty members in the sciences, working at a primarily undergraduate university in California. The purpose of our podcast is reflection, so we bring something we think is working and something we're working on to discuss. Welcome to the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. I'm Claire. And I'm Ruth. And today we are going to answer some listener mail questions. But before we do that, Claire, tell me about your week. My week has been good. I've started reading this book, which um, is called The End of Stress. Uh, Large, (laughs) large clock. Speaking right to me. Yeah, no, it's speaking to me like like essentialism did uh, back in the day. Um, It's by Don Joseph Goway. Uh, The subtitle is Four Steps to Rewire Your Brain. Oh, um, my brain so needs rewiring if it's yeah. stressed. But... And so the and I'm really it's really speaking to my soul, which I think is a phrase you used about essentialism, which is um yeah, it's really I mean he's thinking about how it's practice and as you practice, your brain gets rewired and then it's easier to keep doing the things that lead yeah. to the not stress. So anyway, I'm I'm super into it. And one thing that I've been doing that's kind of related is um I've been thinking about the less stressful approaches to things. Like, for mm-hmm. example, um, on Friday, I was like, okay, I have to prepare for class and I have to grade this exam. And it was like, well, if I... A, a normal way that I might think about this historically would be, well, I'll grade the exam until I have the remaining amount of time left to prepare for class mm-hmm. that um, I think would be a reasonable amount of time to prepare for class. And that will ensure that I spend the maximum amount of time grading possible, which is probably good for efficiency and all that, but it's not very good for stress. For Mm -mm. stress, it's much better to say, let me just prepare for class, finish preparing for class, and then spend the remaining amount of time grading. So anyway, that's been nice. Um, That's awesome. And I'm super, I I definitely want to borrow this book for sure. But um, I'm thinking about, because sometimes too, like there is a little bit in society we sort of like competitively stress. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And just this sort of, oh, man, like I was working until this, like, and it's almost like, you know, I think we've talked about at times just even our approach to work and maybe the fact that pre-pandemic craziness, like I generally didn't work on the weekends and then feeling a bit like ashamed about that. Like, should I be working? Because everyone else is talking about it. But there is this idea that you should be so stressed. And if you're Mm -hmm. not stressed, it's because you're not doing it right. You must not be working hard enough. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it's such a, yeah, it's not. Yeah. And one of the great things, you know, early on in this book, they're talking about if you're in flow state and you're like really getting things done and you're super creative, that that's not stressed and that's right. very productive. In fact, it's probably the height of productivity. So they're actually not connected the way that we often think they are. So, yeah. Well, and sometimes I only measure like how much I must be working by how stressed I am. Mm-hmm. Like, and sometimes I'm like, like when you're in that flow state and you get a whole ton done and then you're like, whoa, did I really do that? Because it didn't feel like I was working because right. exactly. I wasn't like on the brink of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so then it's not, you're not totally. working hard enough. So that's yeah. super interesting. So anyway, I'm, I'm enjoying that. I'm yes. intrigued. So what about you? How was your week? My week was okay. And, you know, I think I've had something that's been just like niggling at me this week. And maybe this is a future episode suggestion. Ooh, but okay. I had a very rude interaction with a student mm. and I was, yeah, I've been really thinking a lot about it and what to do about that sort of thing. And I think I've had a lot of interactions with students in the past that were accidentally rude. <laughs> you know, they don't mean to be and you're <laughs> right. like, oh yeah, that was actually super rude, but it's fine. But this was a little different. So I don't know. I think I definitely, it's a struggle sometimes to think about how much, of yourself you can have in those interactions and how much I think the whole thing was I just ended up smiling and nodding Mm -hmm. and I sort of wish I stood up for myself a bit more but I don't know what that would look like exactly and so it's just niggling at me a little bit where I'm like like it's just still a little irritating and there's some balance between like what's the professional way to respond and also as an instructor right because we're the grown-ups right right so you can't just be like training them to mm-hmm. go off into society. So yes, what what's the balance there? Um, that's yeah. a very interesting so I think, topic. 
Yeah, I think maybe I don't even know how to get the scope of like just interacting with students is too broad, maybe. But like <laughs> something about those times when you have problematic interactions that you're like. It's like learning What's... opportunities that aren't academic or something. Maybe. Right. Yeah. So definitely. So that was a little, uh, but yeah. you know, otherwise good. good okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's, that's a very interesting topic. We'll think about. Yeah. How yeah. And it's tricky. It's so clear if you were teaching little kids. Because, right. But sometimes too, some of the people you're interacting with are age senior to you, but mm-hmm. like you're still in this position of power, but like how much, could you kind of exert like, hey, no, thank you. Or I, I don't know. It's just tricky, 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 tricky. Yeah. I mean, I think um, you can certainly say this is not professional in the academic setting or something because mm-hmm. you are the expert in the academic setting. But yeah, I know that. Yeah. To, to be thought about more for sure. Yeah. And I think I'm having um, a little bit of that thing that comes up for me a lot where like, sometimes students maybe don't take me as seriously Mm. and then you know but then I've had these really nice emails this week from students who were like oh I was so scared of physics and I really appreciate that like you're so I'm like that is what I'm actually trying to access and I should just right appreciate that and not kind of like you're not going to catch everybody with the same net or is right. that even a phrase I don't even I think I just oh I like that, that but, phrase that's a good yeah. phrase <laughs> yeah you're yeah. not going to catch everybody with the same net and it's kind of like we've talked about you 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 can only do it one way and so you should do it the way that works that you think is the way to do it that's congruent with you and, right and um, I think yeah it's going to catch some people but not everybody and that's that's okay yeah yeah so it's, a, it's definitely food for thought for sure yeah but um yeah do you ever but like it's just one of those things where like you know when you revisit the interaction in your head you're like what yeah. if i'd said this uh-huh. what if i'd said that and like it's just like yeah yeah yep, yep. no i know what you mean yeah yeah tricky. totally and it's definitely good practice to think about i mean not to ruminate forever but maybe you will have a better response next time because you have thought about what the best response is you know yeah totally and i think Again, maybe this could come under our interactions, problematic interactions episode or something. But years and years ago, I had it like a frightening interaction with a student mm. that was they were extremely frustrated about something. And I really didn't know what to do. And I thought about it and talked to a lot of people. And it turned out other people had similar things. And you can just say, oh, I'm happy to meet with you in the center office with the chair of the oh, department there. Nice. And like kind of having that sort of in your pocket, like mm-hmm. as always... I haven't had a situation like that come up again, but knowing kind of how I would handle it if it did come up is That's definitely great. reassuring. So totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's so great. anyway, tell me, have you got a quote for us this week? I do. And it's from this book, The End of Stress. Oh, sweet. And um, it says, a change of attitude that changes your experience literally changes your brain structure. Dude. So just back to the idea of actually it gets easier as you practice it because your brain gets rewired with... Uh, those new pathways so you know it's so i think have i shared on here before that i learned to drive pretty late in life oh i don't remember that but late in life sounds like when i was 75 but (laughs) it was like in my 30s um is when i learned to drive and it was right before i was gonna have first baby oh and so i feel like i was very aware of the learning to drive process and how i remember being like how do people do this and talk at the same time? Uh-huh. Like, this is so, it's taking every fiber of my being to concentrate. And now, of course, you know, I can talk and sometimes yell at the kids or like change the <laughs> CD or, you know, that makes it sound like I'm a dangerous driver. But, you know, you can do all those things. one and, thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it is true. And I kind of feel like that when I'm talking to students about learning physics, too, that like at some point it does change your brain structure, right? And you can just totally. do the stuff. So totally. Maybe there's hope. If we can learn to drive, we can learn to be less stressed. I love it. That's a good. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Good hope for You've that, got yeah. good phrases going today. <laughs> Just busting them out all over the place today. Okay, so tell us, what are we doing today? So we are doing listener mail. Um, we have a few questions from um, listeners that people have sent in. Um, and if you are listening and have a question, feel free to send it in for a future listener mail episode. We um, love emails. We, we love emails. It is very true. Um, not from students, but yes, no, we do. <laughs> but from we are even ones. more excited about <laughs> yeah. your emails than we are yeah. about our students. Um, yes, 
We're very okay. excited about your email. So will you read us the first question, Ruth? Yeah. And so the first question we have is from Stefan. And he says lots of lovely things in the email about the podcast. And then his question is, um, how do you plan as a professor or engage with goals? And it says, I mean, what is your relationship to long term goals? Those that have a deadline, tenure file or ones that are more amorphous, like becoming a better researcher. How do you track progress or adjust plans? And what is your social or individual? Sorry, it, what it, it, what of this is social and individual and in what ways? So I'm super interested to hear what you have to say about this, Claire. I have so many thoughts about this and I love awesome. how many different there's so many different aspects to this question. So I, I love this question. Um, I think my main answer to it right now is that lately I've been trying to pick intentionally and not try to do everything at once. So I think my big, mm. <laughs> my one word answer is intentionality. Mm. Um, so yeah, if I'm focusing on making headway on a paper, then maybe that's not the month or semester to revise my homework assignments. Um, so yeah, picking intentionally rather than getting swept away by feeling I have to do it all at once because that is just going to make me overwhelmed. Yes. Um, about longer term goals, I like to think about things like what would be steps now that are going to be really helpful for this longer goal. Like if there's this proposal I want to submit next summer, then would it be really great to have this paper submitted now? And so therefore, should I make submitting this paper a high priority? Um, and if I can't make the paper a high priority now, then that's good to know to adjust plans for this proposal. Or maybe I really need to make that a high priority now, so how can I adjust other things and make that happen? So I, I don't know. Those were kind of things I was thinking about. Um, and one other thought I had was um, if I really want to make a change in the class, <clears throat> I find putting it on the syllabus is very effective because then I'm definitely going to do it when it comes up in the syllabus. Dude, that's terrifying. <laughs> that's exactly why I don't do that because I'm like, then everyone will know I failed. And so that's, well, wow, I, I know. But so cool. it comes back to intentionality because it's completely not a good idea for me to put something on the syllabus that's not actually a high priority for me to do because then I'm going to be stuck either changing mm -hmm. it or doing a lower priority thing just because I put it on the syllabus. So it's, for me, it all comes back to intentionality and remembering that doing things I don't want to do is actually bad. I should do the things I want yes. to do. Um, yeah. So it comes back to my other favorite book of Essentialism by Greg McCohen and just doing the things you want to do intentionally by cutting the I other things. It. Yeah. What about you? What do you think? Well, I mean, first of all, when I got this um, question, I was like, well, this doesn't apply to me because I don't have any goals for this semester <laughs> because everything's just, you know. But then I think in a way, I think actually this semester I did have a goal and like the goal was like trying to stay afloat, you know okay. what I mean? Or like okay. maybe keeping the kids sane and somehow mm -hmm. adapting to this homeschool situation. And yeah, so I think I actually did have like in this semester – it's been like a triage of like, okay, what can I do in work? Mm -hmm. And what can I just like let fall aside so that Ooh, I can focus yes. on staying, you know, sane. But I think in other terms, so like I really like the aspect of the question about, um, you know, having a buddy. Because that's mm -hmm. been super helpful for me is working with you with the tenure stuff. And totally. I genuinely think I might not have submitted this year if we hadn't kind of made it. Well, I mean, the whole making it public on the podcast thing, was <laughs> that kind of, that's like putting it on your syllabus, right? Like it is. Of, yeah. But I think also just our thing of sort of, even previous to this, we would sort of, when we had tenure, not tenure files, but the review files due, we would sort of set deadlines for each other. And that was really helpful. That was super helpful. And so I think, yeah, for me, some of my best goal stuff is trying to corral future Ruth. Oh, into doing things so being like like I think I was you know like say writing the grant mm -hmm. and being like I am going to schedule a meeting with the grant person mm -hmm. to review this in three weeks so then I know that I have to do you know what I mean and so, so breaking it into smaller chunks kind of that are definitely on the calendar because you're meeting with somebody else right that, like setting yeah. exactly or like just having that accountability of mm -hmm. I have scheduled that this is going to happen at this point so because I, I really don't do well with sort of undefined sort of longer term things. I think totally. I have to 
it's, it's like catch myself out seems more negative than I mean it but you know what I mean just sort of have things set up to sort of yeah force my hand a little bit and be like oh I am meeting with so-and-so tomorrow I better have a draft of this written and so mm-hmm. yeah so I think that is one way that I approach it and I think in grad school I used to have a buddy who we would meet and we would make goals and we had mm-hmm. short-term long-term and personal goals and so that mm-hmm. was always our thing and nice th- I love it the- yeah, at the moment, me and Eric have been doing a thing of new moon goals, which I don't even know how we made that up, but we made it up that we would pick things that we would try to do for a month. Okay. And so we kind of just pick them and have, like, whatever it is. And then see if that was something a you thing. want to keep doing or, or yeah, yeah exactly. give it a real then, shot. Because it's only a month, it's, like, yeah. not super. And those are more, like, just random, mm-hmm. like he's like meditating in the morning totally like, you know so not necessarily you know, i love work that stuff but yeah and it's a long like... enough time that you can see the impacts but not so long that it's intimidating you know right and usually what happens for me is the thing that falls away after two weeks is just not a thing i was super interested in doing right. but then other stuff has stayed in there so mm-hmm. yeah so it's been cool but yeah goals man you know Tricky. and I- Uh, Yeah. Another thought. uh, So about the amorphous goals, like improve at being a researcher, that kind of thing. Um, I think it helps to try to get them more specific. Like, yes. Yeah. What is a specific research goal that you want to accomplish that would move toward? I mean, obviously, all the research goals that you're accomplishing are moving you towards being a better researcher. So trying to get them to be more specific. Um, That's, I, like what I, does it mean to be a better researcher yeah totally I had that with like feeling like my research group was just sort of plodding along mm-hmm. and then one semester I was like okay I'm really gonna make this better mm-hmm. but my specific thing was something I had done before is like when other things were happening I would cancel those meetings mm-hmm. because other more and I was like I'm never canceling any of these meetings that mm-hmm. was like Ooh, my specific it. thing that I think made that turn like yeah so I really oh, like what you're great. like if you have nebulous things trying to crystallize them into something yeah yeah Yeah. love it cool all right so the next question is from mossy grading a group assignment where single grade goes to a bunch of students how do you deal with the contribution of each person and um yeah i know this is why i'm terrified of group work this is it (laughs) so yeah so what, what 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 do you do with this? Well, so that's the thing. I have been I've avoided group work like the plague because of kind of issues like this. Or what do you do with terrible groups? Or what do you do with you know? And there's this class that I've co-taught with you and co-taught with somebody else, and they had a group work project that really worked well, and they used this thing called Cat Me. Which is called Categorize Me. That sounds awesome. Okay, yeah, tell me about it. And I think it all comes from, I think in our school, in the engineering department, there is, um, they do a lot of group work. So they seem to have a lot of this stuff dialed in. So the Cat Me thing is one where, and I'm not sure if you have to buy it. So that's something I don't know. But there probably is other versions of it. But it's something, first of all, where you take students and they have to fill in things like what kinds of times a day do you like to meet or when are you free? And so it will kind of group students based on that. And I think there is other parameters you can put in. So like sometimes in groups, there's often concern about like you certainly don't want to have minoritized students outnumbered in the Mm -hmm. group. So if it's a class where like there's not a lot of girls having like three guys and a girl is not a good group dynamic to have or you know whatever things you want to put in it will make the groups for you Mm -hmm. and so that's all well and good but then at a certain point they get this survey about each other and they have to evaluate each other's sort of contributions Mm -hmm. and then we met with the groups and went through those responses which I thought was going to be the worst (laughs) thing I was like literally bright red for the entire interactions but it actually ended up being really good and so we met with them went through the stuff and there was never a case where someone was like that's a lie I did every usually people were like I really dropped the ball and then the other people were like hey it's okay we can work this out and like they kind of nice yeah so it was cool and but there was some aspect of their grade was based on 
those things. So the way the project had been set up was there's some things that they all got credit for. Mm -hmm. And it was weighted based on the kind of survey of each other. Mm -hmm. And then there was at least one aspect that they had to hand in by themselves. I see. So if someone had been a complete freeloader, it was quite clear. Uh Uh-huh. So their contribution to the main project was going to be reduced anyway. Mm -hmm. And then their... If they handed in a rubbish single part of the project, they weren't going to get even a C anyway. So I it see. wasn't. Yeah. So that's that, cool. does that make any sense? I feel that like makes I explained that in a very sense. convoluted way. But and I, I'd heard yeah. a tiny bit about Catmia, but not very much. I'm really glad to have heard that full description of it. Um, and that's interesting because I've done a similar thing where I have some parts of the project be group and some individual. And so, like, you know, maybe they do a group presentation, but they do individual papers. And so it that gets sounds... distributed a little bit. Right. And um, then you, you're kind of getting rid of the freeloader effect. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my, I really like that through what you're talking about, it's kind of training how to be in a group, you know? So having that discussion and saying, oh, it's okay that you dropped the ball. We'll figure out a new system. And then hopefully the, they do figure out a new system. I mean, those are all real life skills for group work. So what do you do? What have you done in the past when you have someone who's just a total no show? Do you I guess one thing I wonder about is it kind of shows up for them in their grade. Mm -hmm. But then the other people in the group. Right. Because are kind of impacted by not having Mm -hmm. like maybe I think the one experience I've had with that, like we definitely graded that person's like that group's work less deeply than we would have if they'd had three people Mm -hmm. sure yeah I don't really have a good system for that I mean one thing that I like to think about is that so many things in life are group projects where it's the product that matters like co-teaching a class or collaborative research or something like that so I don't really mind setting up a similar scenario in the classroom because I'm giving people the practice of working with other people even if they're difficult people yeah um so I don't really mind them having the experience of somebody dropping the ball in their group. But I see the idea of, should I? I like the idea of maybe saying, oh, I know that so-and-so dropped the ball, so I'm not going to require that you have quite as high a level of depth or something because you had to scramble to make up for them. Yeah, I don't know. That That's interesting. Yeah, I think one thing I would love to do, which I can't do, but I would love to sort of empower people to be able to call each other in or, you know what I mean? And be Mm -hmm. like, hey, you know, and it's such a tricky thing. Well, it seems like you did that with this group dynamic. Right. Well, that was, yeah, it was. (laughs) So I'm like, I wish there was a way that I'm like, oh, there is a way. (laughs) But um, yeah, yeah, because it is, I think without a script, it's very hard for students Totally. To maybe advocate for themselves to say, hey, yeah. please do your work. And Well, it's hard yeah. for, I mean, come on. I mean, I would find that hard too. It's even oh, with yeah. lots of group work practice, that's a very hard thing. So I like formalizing it so that they can practice going through that. Um, and it gives the people who did slack off a chance of redeeming themselves, which is awesome. Right. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it really was people just... You know, and I've been there too, where sometimes something just kind of gets away from you. And mm-hmm. then you're like, I can't even fix this. Like, there's no right. way to kind of put this right. And so. But now just... it's a moment to reestablish a new plan and try again. Yeah. 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 But I think one of the key things from what you're saying, too, is having portions that are individual grades mm-hmm. and group grades rather than everybody just gets the same. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Cool. That is a great question, though, yeah. Nancy, and that is part of my dread about group work. <laughs> it's just that. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, and I think the last question we're going to have time for today is from Michael. And it is about, in your classrooms, how do you address the historic and current impact of systemic racism within science in general and or your particular fields? And holy moly, is that a big question for Huge physics? Huge question. Yeah. And physics is very much still in that. Like it's like because some fields you can be like, oh, historically this and that. And then, you know, but then it all turned around and physics is not one of those fields. It is still very much white male dominated field and yet continues to be for many, many various reasons. 
so yeah so do you have thoughts claire or well first i wanted to say to anyone interested in this topic if you haven't oh, yeah. yet um check out our episode 39 which is an interview with um moses rifkin and johan tabora who have this underrepresentation curriculum um that helps guide instructors through having conversations about underrepresentation in the classroom um my main approach to answer the question um, is to pr try to create a setting as an example setting where everyone is welcome and respected and the setting is my classroom. So I don't address the issue directly, like explicitly, but instead my intent is that if I'm successful in making someone feel welcome in this part of the scientific community, maybe they'll feel more confident in belonging in the more broad scientific community. Um, and similarly, I hope that everyone in the classroom becomes used to everyone belonging in this setting and then might be more likely to perpetuate that culture of, um, of belonging and respect more broadly in the community. So I'm trying, that's, that's my approach um, to what I specifically do in my classrooms. What about you, Ruth? Well, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you think, because I think I love that and I love that kind of modeling that. And do you, do you think like even internally without broadcasting it, do you have a little bit more of like an antenna towards students who might not feel like they belong? I do keep do you that know? in mind. I, yes, that's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I would be more looking for their questions or contributions, I suppose, if they had, if I had some inclination that they might feel like they didn't yeah. belong, you know? Yeah. Yeah, dude, I feel like for me, I it's just such a work in progress. And every time I think I've stumbled on an answer, it's like, oh, yeah, that wasn't that was not the thing. And so I think um, I think for me, too, some of it is definitely a little bit of a journey where when I moved to America, I was like, how great to move to this post-racial society where this isn't a problem anymore. And then you're like, oh, wait, this is not. Because, you know, from the outside, it's very much conveyed that way. And mm -hmm. moving from a culture which is very homogeneous, like Irish, and it's much, it's getting less so, but certainly when I grew up, everybody was Irish and everybody was Catholic and, you know, it sure. was a very homogeneous society. And even, you know, Eric was considered to have a very, you know, unusual name because his name was Eric and it was not like a biblical name or an oh. Irish name. And so anyway, it's definitely when I got here, I feel like I've been on a very steep curve of trying to learn mm -hmm. about racial injustice and sort of social justice in general and also specifically in America and in physics. And so, yeah, it's definitely just been a constant thing to address. And I, what am I trying to say? I think one thing that I try and do in the classroom is definitely talk about it and mention that there is this huge disparity in demographics in physics. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that and it sometimes has gone really, really wrong. And it's been a complete powder keg. And other times I've sort of mentioned things about the patriarchy and then my evals are like, she hates all men and she hates white men even more than any other man. And like, it's, definitely gone a bit sideways so i have started on the first day doing a bit of a speech about uh -huh. you know you may hear me mention some of these things and it does not mean i'm actually against male people or it does not mean i'm against white people or you know i'm trying to sort of drag some of that out into the open and this year okay i certainly had with my um introduction discussion forum things got kind of hairy politically mm. in a way that I did not anticipate and so on the first day I said look we are not going to talk about politics but we are going to talk about social justice mm -hmm. and our university has had a mandate where we're supposed to sort of do that or is that coming or something uh, this I think is it's... the first I've okay. it, so <laughs> I think there's been tell. some discussion about it so I kind of pretended it was university sanctioned but I don't know if that's totally a thing but um the other way I've tried to illustrate it this year was on my canvas page um each week for the modules I have had a physicist be like there's an image of the physicist cool and then in that week's module there's like a wikipedia entry about that person mm -hmm. and I haven't like deliberately said 
this is me addressing the fact that we normally just see white male physicists, but sure, I've just sort of done it low key. And some students seem like they read it every week and they read about whoever it is. And so they're into that. So that, and nice. it's funny to me, it's weird because I feel like I have so many women in that. I was like, God, look at all the women I have. And I actually don't. It's not more than 50%. Uh, but it's just you're so unused to seeing them. It feels like, yeah, you know what I mean? It feels like kind of, yeah. That's I cool. I am, this is the the water that I swam in for a long yeah. time in physics. Yeah. So, so you're seeing yeah. it in your own perception. But hopefully you're helping your students have a different perception. Yeah. And I think so. I think the things that I'm trying to do is sort of subtle I guess like just having that up there but not really commenting on it and maybe talking about a little bit that we will talk about that it is white male dominated field Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you know what that means and then I think the other things would be more like what you had talked about where I have an awareness of maybe students of color are going to be less likely to shout the answer out so trying to find other ways Mm -hmm. that they can participate and have their voices heard Mm -hmm. you know or whatever it is so that is yeah 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 that feels like a really all around answer not super (laughs) concise but (laughs) definitely I think the main thing I'm doing is just trying to educate myself about how to better support all students and then maybe acknowledging that it is going to be more difficult Mm -hmm. not more difficult but it's definitely you're less visible challenges yeah yes Mm -hmm. yeah yeah So hopefully, Michael, I would be super curious to hear your thoughts about it if you want to follow up. I would love to hear that. And maybe like Claire mentioned, checking out that episode about the underrepresentation curriculum. Cool. Well, thanks for all these great questions. This has been really interesting. And um, yeah, to, to, to Michael, Stefan and Mossy, if you have other questions, please send them. And to everybody, we would love, we love emails. So... We do. We love emails. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening. And thanks, Ruth, for this great discussion. Thanks so much for joining us on the Professor Podcast with Ruth and Claire. We're delighted to have you as a listener and we would love to hear from you. And if you want to email us, our address is contactprofessorpodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear any of your suggestions for future shows or professor quotes that you might want to share with us or even just things that have come up for you when you were listening to previous episodes. And if you've been enjoying the podcast, we would love if you would spread the word. So the best way to spread word is by telling people, you know, if you think they should listen to it, or you can leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.